Hi. Hi, everyone. This is Brendan Larson from God or Absurdity. Um, and uh, today we're going to um, be talking about is precept irrefutable? Um, and I've got uh, James here um, who uh, I think calls himself the open air atheist. No. Um, sorry, he's saying no. Well, no, that's, that's not my name. No. I used to be called the open air atheist. I've, for the last couple of years, I've been. Uh, atheist. Oh, atheist. Okay. Atheist. Uh, that's that's my YouTube channel. I slash uh, theist. Okay. All right. Well, I might be able to update the title uh, later. Or just I'm look not, at my. I'm not sure, but I can put that in the uh, un underneath in the um, description about the video, um, and hopefully we'll be all right with the connection. I think I might need to stop the um, picture of me at some stage just because it's a bit laggy yeah um, but we'll, we'll see how we go and we'll, we'll do our best um, so uh, my name's Brendan uh, Brendan Larson and I'm um, from New Zealand I've been running the God or Absurdity Facebook page and website for about a year now and um, today or yesterday I uh, was uh, looking on Facebook for atheist pages and I found a Facebook page on nihilism, or nihilism however you say it, uh, and I, I think um, somehow that led to um, me discovering James, uh, his, his Facebook page. Uh, and there was one meme there that uh, caught my eye and uh, I posted it on my Facebook page and the meme said that all of our best facts, uh, now let me get it, I should, I'll, I'll quote it exactly, uh, where is it? A fact is the glitter on the surface of a soundless sea, a ray from the sun forever shrouded, and our most certain facts are only our best guesses. Uh, and that's a quote from... Benjamin D. Cuss series, is that how you say it? Yep, that's how you say it. So I, I left a comment on his Facebook page underneath that meme uh, quoting the, our most certain facts are only our best guesses and asked the question, is that a certain fact or only a best guess? Uh, and that uh, also pointing out that it's a self-refuting statement and absurd to say that. Um, so um, yeah, and, and my understanding with Facebook memes is that anything or anything that's posted on Facebook, um, it's uh, you don't have to ask for permission to post, to copy and paste it and put it onto your own Facebook page. Uh, that the law around that is fair use and if a person's not making money from something, then they're allowed to to do that, um, and it goes on all the time. And it's just I, I see it as part of the fun of of Facebook, um, and um, it's getting the word out there. It's kind of free advertising for your own page. I do, I haven't hidden the attribution that uh, goes towards his. Facebook page, which is uh, Decasserian Nihilism. Um, and so, yeah, I don't, I don't um, understand why, um, James, you, you, you have a problem with that. Well, I can kind of understand, um, you know, that where you're coming from, but to me, I, I think that I haven't well, done here, anything here's wrong. My, here's my contention, and I'll just introduce myself real quick, and then I'll, I'll lay yep. out my contention. Okay. Yeah. So, my name is James Stillwell, atheist, um, whatever you want to call me, and uh, I'm a former Reformed uh, apologist, street preacher. Um, I actually did some preaching with uh, Kirk, uh, not Kirk Cameron, uh, Ray Comfort in 2010, May 11, 2010, and um, a short time after that, I I uh, had a deconversion. Um, and um, some of you may, you know, know me from maybe Dr. White's show or whatever, 
the, the annoying atheist who calls in and and uh, um, then Dr. White challenges him on the you know challenges me on um, Bart Ehrman's assertions as though they were mine and clearly they weren't. I was appealing to his work, but anyways, that's that's another story. So I've been doing videos um, against uh, theism now since two, late or say early 2011, and uh, yeah. You still there, right? Yeah, yeah, I'm still there. Okay, and I've also um, I've also critiqued a lot of the new atheist movement, the political leftist movement. Um, I've, I've also critiqued, uh, critiqued them as far as their value judgments, because because I'm a moral nihilist. So to be fair, I try to uh, I don't just on my channel I don't I don't just bash on theists. Um, I bash on anything that I see to be um, just false. Uh, and, uh, you know, um, baseless. So, I think that's one point where you and uh, your viewers might be able to agree with me, you know, on that issue. Hmm. So, you're a, you're a moral... Oh, sorry. Yeah. I, I, I'm a moral nihilist, but I um, have a qualified form. I just wrote a book, which should be out, I'm hoping, uh, by the first um, on metaethics, which pretty much uh, critiques um, secular and theistic ethics. Hmm. Though I do tend to spend more time critiquing se uh, secular ethics. Utilitarianism, uh, contractarianism, um, you know, things like that. So most of my book is really aimed at uh, atheistic, so-called atheistic morality. Um, I also attack humanism uh, and stuff like that. So have you published that book, last... sorry, or, or you're working on a book, did you say, sorry? Well, it's finished. Um, yeah. I'm just waiting for it to get back from England because it's it's um, going to be done with the editing process here. Any you know, um, I was told by a person editing it uh, that it, you know a couple days max, and that was yesterday. So could be any day now. Um, okay. And then at the and end, what, it, the the last the last the, three chapters are on. Today? It's called Power Nihilism: A Critique of Moral Realisms. And um, the last three chapters is a overview of Nietzsche's Willard Zermach, which is an atheistic form of idealism, um, ontological idealism. And uh, it also deals with the sociological and the psychological uh, aspects of, of Willard Zermach or will to power. Okay. So, have you studied um, philosophy at university, or just just, just your own self-study? No, I, I have a lot. Of, I'm self-studied. Uh, um, you know, I have friends that are like, for instance, the guy who's editing my book is taught philosophy uh, philosophy um, in a university for some time. Um, and he has you know various degrees in philosophy, and so I've learned a lot over the years from mostly for my own self-study, but kind of guided by friends that are teaching philosophy. So oh. that's where I kind of get it. Um, so I just, I, just call, I just call myself a philosopher, and if people want to say, well, you don't have a piece of paper, so you're not a philosopher, then I'll just say, well, we just have differing definitions of what a philosopher is then. I mean, a lot right. of philosophers didn't have degrees. They didn't have, uh, you know, uh, degrees from colleges. So, um, for me to judge, you know, somebody's credentials is not a piece of paper, but it's to talk to them and find out what they know, and then make decisions based on that. Um, so uh, that's where I'm at. Now, I wanted to talk about De Casiers just real quick because yeah, he's I've a, never heard of him before, so it's interesting. Yeah. 
So the reason why your criticism doesn't apply is because De Cassiers has a totally different ontology than you do. De Cassiers is not a realist. It doesn't have a realist ontology. So, Sorry, what um, does on oncology mean? I thought that was ontology. something. Ontology. All oh, right. So. <laughs> yeah, comes from the comes from the Greek word in 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 your Bible called uh, ontos, which means being. So it it's it's talking about it's the branch of metaphysics. It's talking about what. All oh, right. Yes. Yeah. So the exists. ontological argument and things like that. Right. Yeah. 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 I must hear you. Sorry. Yeah. So, De Cassiris doesn't really have a. Uh, a realist ontology for so of course for him to say that facts are you know just our best guesses it kind of is if we take for instance the problem of um, other minds which I briefly mentioned in a, in a comment um, problem of other minds is that you cannot know that other minds actually exist right hmm. because you cannot get inside of their first person experience it's a it's the law of identity. You can only be you. You can only be one thing. Hmm. You cannot be someone else. And in order to know that someone else has internal what it's like or experiences, this is what gets into philosophy of mind, um, then you cannot say that there are other minds with absolute certainty. You could say, uh, for example, if we go to Chalmers' P-Zombie issue, or Chalmers is, you know, launching an argument against materialist reductionism, and he's talking about, you know, we could all be P zombies. Um, mm. Not, not me. I know I'm not a P zombie, but you could be a P zombie. You could look, act like a conscious being, but not actually be. There be nothing going on inside, right? Mm. We could invent a robot in the future so complex that it would look and act just like it was conscious. But it wouldn't be conscious. It would just be running software, right? It would just be running, it would just be running programs. So um, this is a way of showing that qualitative states are not reducible to quantitative states. Right? Mm. So um, for De Cassiers, uh, what we he has a couple different theories that he dances around, but one with them, one was them, one of them seemed kind of like a, a will to power kind of Nietzschean idealism, and another one seemed more of an Eastern metaphysics, um, and he seems to try to incorporate both. So there's a whole lot to to De Cassir's philosophy, and I don't want to hmm. bog this down with talking about that because that would take a long time to uh, more than uh, when they'll. You know, Google Hangout could mm. accomplish to, you know, yeah. to expound um, his philosophy. Right. But so ba that's why I'm saying that he's not saying that the inner fact of consciousness isn't real. He's not saying that the fact that I'm experiencing blueness or yellowness or the feeling of sadness or whatever isn't a fact. He's saying that is the only fact you can actually know. You can't know that. Um, uh, let me give you an example of one way that we often just beg the question. Um, if we were to test the human eye, right, we'd have to presuppose the validity of the human eye in order to study it in the first place. Yeah. So we don't actually know the human eye is reliable. We have to presuppose that it is in order to study its reliability, to look through a microscope at a human eye, and must employ our human eye, right? Yeah. So that would be one you know, way of saying we have to presuppose that our human eye is giving us um, valid reports about an external world. Hmm. And we already know to some extent that that's not exactly true. But Right. And, I mean, I understand you know, the arguments around skepticism and um, solipsism and things like that. And, and that's, in a sense, I agree with a lot of it, uh, but I see it as being absurd. You know, the idea that we could be brains in a vat or that we could be in the matrix or we could be in a Hindu illusion where everything is Maya and, 
you know, those, those kind of scenarios. I use them on my Facebook. I don't. I don't see and, how. And I don't see how. The, I don't see how everything being a representation of force is an absurdity. Um, I don't think you understand what Maya means in the idealist context, right? Maya has many meanings. It's where we get our words measure, to measure, right, meter, um, all of this uh, matter, mother. We get all of these words um, stemming from that word. So uh, Maya can mean a lot of different things. So I have to, to really press you on what you mean by... Uh, well, when I use the word Maya, my, what I mean is, and I think that I, I understand it, is that uh, it's, it's the belief that um, everything is an illusion, you know, the, the, the matrix kind of idea, you know, that um, the reality that we are experiencing is not really real, and in, in the Hindu context they see the um, Brahman um, as being a, a yeah, what is real force behind the universe, um, but yeah, and and so well, exactly what is real, you know? And without God, there is no way of knowing reality to any degree, and so that well, the statement or, or knowing anything for certain, and so the statement that everything is just our best guesses, without God, that is true. But the problem is it's self-refuting because you end up. Uh, being certain that you can't know anything for certain. No, he's not talking about. Um, it's not true, and I just <clears throat> before we got into this, I just illustrated a certainty that you could have. For example, you don't know that I exist, but you could infer my existence. You could know and have an. You know that you have a first-person experience of something that you call me, right? You mm. can't get inside of my head to see that I'm you know, not a pea zombie, but you well, can know with absolute well, certainty I'd, I'd that... Argue that I argue that I do know for certain that you exist. Well, and, you know, to argue against that is absurd. No, I would say that you're false. And, and, I, and again, I used to argue these points probably long before you ever heard of them. The same points that you're making now, I used to argue. So well, that, that, that's one of, the other claim, one of the other claims that I've, I've heard you make, and I, I just wonder how much you've studied presuppositional apologetics. Well, I studied Bonson, Van Til. Um, you know, I, I've studied a lot of presuppositional apologetics, mm. right? And I've, I've you, even debated Stai on this on this subject, and I've right. even uh, debated well, his friend. That. I've even debated his friend Dustin Seegers. These are private, but if you go ahead and PM Dustin Seegers, he'll tell you that he's me and him have chatted about these things. Oh, okay. Fact, so yeah, when you say book that he's running around oh. with the little book that he's running around using in debates right now called Neonalism, the Philosophy of Power, is put out by a friend of mine, and I turned him on to that book. That's the same guy who's editing my book. So, right. um, you know. We've already discussed these things. It's just that Sai magically lost the audio. Um, we weren't live streaming. He was supposedly recording it. And um, after it didn't turn out so hot for him, he magically lost the the uh, video and audio of the uh, of the report. I don't know if it's he magically lost it or he just said that it wasn't quality. I can't remember what it was, but he refused to to upload it. Um, well, that's, that's, that's your perspective on it, you know, saying, oh, it didn't turn out so hot um, for him. I, I find that hard to believe. Um, you know, I've, I've watched most of his debates um, and, and listened to his audio debates as well, and, and um, so I find that claim a bit um, a bit hard to believe, but that's your, of your perspective. You You're biased. We're all biased. Well, we all have, we, yeah, we all have a, have a bias. Well, one other thing I wanted to, to mention, though, is really before we started this, this Hangout uh, off here, you, you mentioned um, about um, taking a meme without asking is kind of like stealing. And, and you know, you were talking as if um, that moral 
Absolutely. No, I wasn't. No, exist. No, you, no you, I wasn't. You were talking. No, I wasn't. Well, and if I'll there's no... Why. Okay, I'll explain right. why. My, my um, assertion was, if we want to have a relationship in which I can trust you, then you ought not steal. That's a logical, coherent argument, but it's not objective because it's based on a subjective if clause. As Wait a minute. All, ought, how do you get an ought from an is? You, you know that philosophical problem, no, right? Yeah, and it, the, the argument, you're, I cover this in my book. I color, it's called the chapter is chapter two, and it's called According to Hume. Breaks down Hume's is ought gap, and it explains that all oughts are con conditioned by an if clause. As long as you condition it with the if clause, if I want, X, then I ought to do Y, it's not fallacious, but the problem with it is that it's not objective. There's nothing objectively binding or obligatory about these types of oughts. They're rational oughts, right? Um, if you want to live, you ought to drink water, right? It's You're using reason to accomplish your goals, but reason isn't the goal itself, and, um, you know, as, as uh, Hume also stated that reason is and always will be the slave of the passions. Right, the ought, the if I want. So if I want, then I ought to do why is not fallacious. What would be fallacious would be for me to say something like, um, Bob is kicking puppies for fun outside of his uh, employer's business. Right. So Bob works at a at a uh, at a pet shop. Therefore. Um, uh, we could say, okay, so this harms, this kind of activity harms Bob's um, employer's um, finances, right? Um, it could cause the pet shop to get closed down, right? Therefore, Bob ought not do it. Well, that doesn't work, right? Because mm -hmm. it's 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 omitting the if clause, which is but, if but Bob if. cares about. Sorry, they, they, they Bob cares what, about his employer. Yeah, sorry, you, you carry on. Go sorry. Ahead. Oh, okay. All right, I'll, I'll interject just there. So, the problem with the, the if clause is here? the if clause assumes that you know the right goal. And how do you know that the right goal no, is it doesn't. to have a harmonious there's no, relationship? No, there's no such thing as a right There's no such thing as a, a, a right goal. Now you're presupposing that we ought to be harmonious. There's. That's that's an if clause in itself. You're making this harder than it has to be. What we're what I'm saying is is that it's always contingent on an if clause, which is what makes atheist morality subjective and not binding or obligatory in every, anybody else. So if so you try so to attack like that, Hitler. then you are feeding in. If you try to attack that, you're feeding into the atheists. So uh, I would suggest that you don't. Do I don't that. see how I'm feeding into atheists. So, so someone like Hitler, though, um, was what he did in killing six million Jews objectively morally wrong? What do you mean by well, that's begging a lot of questions? What do you? Because first, well, thing see, for him, he would, he would Hitler, Hitler would argue that his if clause was that um, you know if he wants to take over the world, he has to kill six million Jews. So who are you to say that he's wrong? Yes, is it possible that he's exactly. Right? I agree. I agree with it, you. I'm a moral nihilist. This is where I say, yeah, so it's I possible agree. Hitler, Hitler was right. Is, you know, he could he could use the same kind of logic to say, if I want to destroy six million Jews, I ought to do it with this machine, that machine, and this machine, right? It's not arguing for morality, as I said in, in the beginning when I brought this if clause issue up. I was I said it. They were rational odds, right? They're rational in the sense that you're using logic to tell you to argue from one subjective desire to how to accomplish that subjective end, right? But what, so what's irrational, want, though, about what Hitler did, and his his thinking was that what he was doing was totally rational based on morality, Darwinism, this is where what, survival of the fittest, is, and, and he wanted to kill the, the Jews because he saw them as being inferior and less evolved, and, and he saw the Aryan, you know, Germanic race as being higher evolved, therefore that he was doing the world a favor by destroying the Jews. How is that irrational? 
I didn't say it, it's irrational. Well, you said, it's it's you said it's based on rational, blah, blah, blah. It's, it's based on the if clause. If it's not based on rational, you're using rationality to accomplish your ends. That's what's kind of rational about it. What isn't rational about it is that it's always based on the contingent if clause, if I want. And no objective if clause means no objective ought clause. Without that objective ought clause, you cannot have an objective morality. You cannot have moral realism. You need to have a universal if clause. This is something that ontologistics are, wow. Um, Peter Sertet H. explained in his book, um, uh, Neo Nihilism, the Philosophy of Power, which you can get in, uh, on, on Amazon for $6.66. Uh, and, and actually, as I've already stated, um, you know, Dustin Seegers understands the arguments and agrees with them very much and uses them in debates with atheists. If you go watch his latest uh, debates with atheists, he's all using that, that book that I, that I uh, turned him on to. So we have to get over the contingent if clause, right? Because Every time you make a moral assertion, it always begs the question, according to whom, right? Which is mm -hmm. the first chapter of my book, according to whom, right? So if you say, you ought not have um, kicked that puppy, well, according to whom, right? It's, it's an opinion. You're just asserting, I don't like that, basically. If you were to, to ask anybody, um, any atheist, why, why ought we... Um, why ought we get along, right? Um, why ought we be for equality, right? And if you really just keep hammering them on, on that and keep asking and peeling back layers, it's always going to come down to, because I don't like that. Hmm. And so that's because every ought is contingent on the if clause, which is the I don't like that. Do you see what they're hmm. getting it now? Are you understanding? Well, so, I, un I understand that that's the position. So it's, that, not that, that. it's not that Hitler was rational. It's that Hitler was using logic to get to to accomplish his ends right if i want to drink if i want to live i ought to drink water that's that's rational right i want to live mm -hmm. and in order to accomplish my goal which isn't rational the way i'm going about it is rational so like um okay it follows that i need water to live so i'm going to drink water to accomplish that goal right if i said if i want to live i ought um drink battery acid that's probably not, you know, that's not going to work, right? It doesn't follow from the if I want, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the problem. Like, and the, the other problem that I point out in my book is that even if you bring God into the subject, it doesn't change the if clause. If we, if we argue from the is that your God exists, it doesn't matter because I'm going to ask you, from that is, how do you derive an ought? Now, if you just say he's God, you're begging the question. That doesn't matter. It's irrelevant. I could say, well, he's Hitler. It it doesn't it doesn't follow. So, one thing I point out in the book, in my book, is one thing that Peter Sertert Hughes doesn't um, point out in his book, which is that because he's just presupposing atheists in his atheism in his book, whereas I'm not. Um, he doesn't point that out. That even if you have a God in in the picture from that is you cannot derive an ought you could say you could argue from consequentialism well if you don't want to burn in hell then you ought to do this but see you're still basing it off that subjective if i want or if i don't want so morality i would argue is a, is a probably a subject you're going to want to stay clear of <laughs> with me. Um, or can, or can, any can atheist. I okay. yeah, can I respond? <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. So, I mean, the way I see it is that what you're saying, it makes sense from an atheistic worldview where yeah, you can't have moral absolutes. But the problem is that um, you, you end up with absurd things, like absurd scenarios where uh, you can't actually say that what Hitler did was definitely morally wrong. Um, and, I don't and, see that as absurd. How? Sorry, go ahead. Well, 
you can say you don't see it as absurd. I think most people would would uh, see it as absurd. The idea that Hitler could have been right in what he did, and not only absurd but dangerous. Yeah, populist. Because if he could no, have been, we're been not saying right that Hitler could have been did, right. Well, I that's don't not, see that you've got any not, basis to say that what position. he did was morally wrong. Um, be objectively morally wrong. You, I don't see we how don't. you've got any basis for that. Well, yeah, well, there you go. So, you know. No, we don't. And I just admitted that. I, I just spent all this time telling you why in detail. Why? Of course not. Of course. Yeah, I, just, I mean, I'm being very consistent, don't you think? Well, you've been consistent with your atheistic worldview. But see, within the Christian worldview, we have a basis for morality based on the character and nature of God. So it's wrong to murder people because God no. is not a murderer. It's wrong to steal because God is not a thief. It's wrong to you know do harm that to doesn't bridge the is our gap. because uh, we are all created in God's image and we have human dignity and human rights. That's a genetic fallacy. Because no. we are made in the image of God and and. and out of that, yeah, there are certain commands in the Bible, you know, thou shalt not kill, you know, things like that, that we can uh, understand ethics from and have a basis for objective morality. But ultimately, it's not based on the commands of God, it's based on the character of God. Um, so, yeah, within the Christian framework, we have a basis for morality, uh, but without God, you're on sinking sand. You can keep asserting that. You can keep asserting that, but you haven't proven that because all you've done is asserted that these emerge from God's character, right? But I could just assume that. I could just assert that they emerge from Bob, Bob down at the pub. You know, Bob. They emerge from his character, right? Yeah, but are they are they your justification you for the, how you know things? Is Bob your justification you, for knowledge? You can't get from the is, huh? Because Bob is. In, in is itself, Bob, is Bob, Bob your is, ultimate authority? In my experience, in, my ultimate authority is me. I'm I'm a mind, and that's what minds do. It's like asking well, me, if you're your um, own ultimate why is A A? If you're your huh? own Sorry? authority, the question is, could you be wrong about everything you claim to know? No, not everything. No. So what's what do you know, and but how again, do you, you know? Have an What's answer, one thing you know you for certain, the, and how do you know? What you you haven't answered the question, and I'll be glad to move right on to that, but you still haven't gotten to how you get from the is that God has a certain characteristic to we ought do that. Because, see, I can make the same argument if you want to call that a logical argument. I can grant you that. And you can say humans have the characteristic of violence, therefore they ought to be violent. Humans have – some humans have the characteristic of child molestation, therefore they ought uh, molest children. And you could say, well – but God doesn't. And I could say, well, so what? How do you get from the is that he has these characteristics to anyone ought conform to them? That's, well, that's a situation that you... Now, I'll be happy to in move order, on in to... Order, the solution to the is ought thing is knowing the right goal. And we do know <laughs> the right goal in with a biblical right worldview. Right according to whom? The, the right, right goal according, according to, to God. According to God. That, that well, that's all made in God's image. I, it's not. It's not right according to me. It's not. It's not right according to me. You see what I'm saying? Well, so you're arguing with God. You're just see? asserting God's opinion, and you're saying that we ought to conform to this opinion. It's not God's opinion. It's not God's opinion. If God exists, okay. morality is objective, and I, I was uh, you surprised that that. earlier that you, that you, you were God trying to argue morality, that. Here, I can I can counter that. If God exists, morality is not objective. Well, that's just absurd. Well, what you said is just absurd. <laughs> well, we can go back and forth all, all day yeah. here. And and part of the problem is proof is not persuasion. We can lay things out, and the other person doesn't necess oh, not necessarily. Oh, don't give me that. Be, be I used persuaded. to use that same line. Yeah, I used to use that same line, and I and I agree with that. But don't use it on me because I know that probably better than, than most people that you'd be talking to on the internet. Okay, because right, well, I used to use that same line to screaming atheists and humanists uh, who who are you know want to kill their babies and, and all this other stuff. So yeah. don't don't throw right, well, that stuff back. That's my old arguments regurgitated. What I'm saying is is that um, 
we can move on to the epistemic because I don't think we're you're going to admit that. Um, yeah, God I, I don't want to spend the whole discussion on morality. I want to. You're, you're just uh, going to. Yeah, you're just going to knowledge you're just gonna, you're and just keep asserting that. And, and, yeah. Because the thing is, in order to have morality, you need to be able to know things. So we need to, we need to talk about how you know things. Um, According to your worldview, because yeah, in the to talk about, worldview we, we have a basis for knowing things. How, we, sure, we, we need to talk about how God knows anything. So, how does God know anything for absolute certainty? How does He know well, that any minds exist outside of His? Oh. That's <laughs> you're making question. God. You're making it's God regular. into the same level as us. <laughs> no, my point that I'm trying to make is that any worldview, if you peel back any worldview, pick one even your own, there are going to be some layers that you're just going to have to say, well, it just is the way it is. And see, I can do that too. I can say, well, it just is the way it is. I just am a mind, and that just is what minds do. They think, they make value judgments, and they represent their environment in a way that's conducive to their goals. And so I don't even need, I can, I can concede all day long that I do not have the access to the in itself as far as a reality, and that the only in itself I have access to is that I'm experiencing blueness, that I'm experiencing some sort of emotion, but anything beyond that, oh, I can't know that with absolute certainty. Of course not. And I can but see it, that it, all day long, and it still doesn't mean that I don't have absolute certainty because I am an in itself as being a mind. A mind is an in itself. So even if I was a brain in a vat, well, the only thing I could know for certain is myself and what I'm experiencing, that experiencing ex experiences are occurring. Now, whether I'm experiencing an illusion, it doesn't matter. It's still an experience that I have absolute access to. Whether that experience correlates to some sort of physical reality, I may not know, but I still have absolute knowledge that that experience is, is being experienced. So as, that's as you what are, experience is. It's something so, you experience. So yeah. by definition, can I can I interject there? By definition, or try to clarify. Go ahead. Right. So basically, mm -hmm. is what you're saying is that um, we can't know anything for certain apart from that we exist. Is is that basically what you're saying? I'm saying, well, then we're going to have to get into define we and what we mean by that, and that's that's a bit crazy. It's like define blue. Well, the only thing you could do is point at it, right? Because well, blue I mean, is thing, not a wave. You can't, you can't even know that blue is blue because you know if if you were a no, brain, I didn't say that. That's not what I said. That's not what I said. I know yeah. that my blue is blue. I can't know that your blue isn't my green. When you point this to a yeah, fire you could, and you say when you when you, that's red. when you say the the word blue and you say my blue, it might actually not even be your blue because if you were a brain in the vat, uh, you're surrounded by uh, a room with pink walls, but in reality, you know you you and and you're in a out of out of the you're vat. Missing the, you're, 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 missing the you're missing the point again. You're you're missing the point again. I've already conceded that. I don't even know why you're bringing that up. I've already said that. Because what I'm I saying is, is that the blue that I'm hold on, the blue that I am experiencing, I can know that that I am experiencing that blue. It may not be reflective of the pink walls, which would be the in itself, right? To, to borrow from Kant's terminology, it would not be the in it, the you know I would not have access to the to the pink walls that are external from my mind. But I do have access to what is internal to my mind, which is the experience of blueness. Like, for instance, I can be sad about a situation. That first person feeling of what it's like to be sad, or that first person experience of moral outrage, or whatever you want to call it, is still something I have. I can know with absolute certainty that I am experiencing. Why? Because I'm experiencing it. And that is what minds do. Right? But just because you're so, experiencing something doesn't mean it's true. It means it's true in my subjective experience that I am. But that's not true. It's only true. It's not. Well, it's certainly not abs absolute truth. Your own subjective experience. We're talking about absolute truth. Do you, do you do you accept that we can know things to be absolutely true? Um. I would. 
have to say that uh, I would have to ask you to define what you mean by the term absolute because if I were to rip I was actually just writing something on absolute and um, okay. so absolute truth um, is a truth that is true for all people at all times in all places okay so I would say that it's true that if minds exist right that uh, they have experiences, okay? Because that's what minds do. And if they didn't have experiences, then they wouldn't be minds. So I would say that that's absolutely true, and that um, is by you know the nature of what a mind is. That is um, something that's universally true. I'm How not do you know that, that your thoughts aren't have... just floating through the ether, and you're part of the Hindu illusion where nothing really exists other than the the, the um what do they call God Brahma um, and yeah your thoughts are, are not really you do you, do you know just what the God this, Brahma this is the... See, I've actually I've actually studied this stuff in depth so when you bring up these things and you just throw them out there as if they're absurd and you don't even understand what is what is first off what is Brahman what is the ontological uh, well, nature of Brahman what is an impersonal God that is the force behind the whole universe and so, that, so within within uh, Christianity, we, we say um, love your neighbor, but um, within Hinduism, you are your neighbor. There is no distinction between uh, individuals because all is one. And I understand That's that not not, not all Hindus a, believe that. But many Hindus do, and the question is, if that's the case, then how can you know anything to be true? And how do you know that that is not the case? In Hinduism, um, God is pure awareness. So he's the awareness behind your eyes. When you're not thinking, and when you're just um, aware... How can, how can an impersonal force be aware? Can I explain? So I'm going to explain this to you. So. Right. Um, when you're just aware, um, that is so. The Hindu Brahman is is basically the awareness behind every mind, right? It is it is the one looking out through everyone's eyes. It's not the ego or the personality or the thought forms which which pass before the awareness, right? It is the thing that is aware of the thinking. It is the no thing, I should say, that is aware of the thinking. It's not a thing. Awareness isn't a thing. One way to describe it would be to, to make it a, an analogy to on your screen, there's space, and then there are things on that space. Without that space, that those things on the screen could not exist because to exist means to stand out. That's what um, it meant you know, uh, for, th for thousands of years. It means to stand out. So something that has borders and boundaries exists. Something that doesn't have borders and boundaries doesn't exist in that sense, okay? So in that sense, their God doesn't exist. He's a, he's, he's pure awareness. He is the, to look at it another way, if the, all of existence was blue, how would you ever know it? You could never know it because there would be no differentiation between anything. Everything would just be blue. And the only way you know black is because of white. The only way you know up is because of down and these contrasts, these relational properties. So how does, yes, ultimately they are saying that the, um, to, to use Kant's terminology again, ultimately they're saying each ego, each personality, um, and external things, relational properties, are not the in itself. It doesn't mean that they don't have some um, relative existence. It just means that that's all they have is relative existence. They're not the absolute. So now one can make an, a logical argument for this. One could say, um, the existence is relative, right? So existence is, is relational properties. This exists because of that, that exists because of this, right? If, if there was no space, you would not exist because you would just be endless and there, there would be no borders and boundaries to you to distinguish you from anything else, okay? So 
existence is necessarily relational, which means it's another way of saying relative. But if exist if relational is the only thing that exists, then it becomes the absolute, which is a contradiction in terms. Therefore, um, the relational must be ultimately not the in itself, because that would be a contradiction in terms. That's one argument you could make, but I'm not a Hinduist. I've just studied um, it to, so I can talk about it, because I don't just like talking about things that, and, and strawmanning their positions when I don't actually understand their positions just to bolster my own. You know, I want to, to understand what I'm talking about so that I can help people better understand that position. And then if I have critiques, I can actually attack what is being put forth and not some dressed up straw man of that position. Just, yeah, all right, all right. Can, can I, that just can makes I, me look, look <laughs> ignorant. Yeah, I'm, I not saying you're, I'm not saying that you're... Yeah, I, I mean, have looked into Hinduism and, and I, I, I believe that I understand it, but um, to a reasonable degree. But the thing is, all of this is coming back to how do you know anything for certain? And okay, I personally don't believe that according to your worldview you can even know that you exist. But let's say that for the sake of the argument I concede that point and, um, that you can know with absolute certainty that you exist. Where do you go from there? If, if you say that I can't know anything that... Wait, say that again? What's your well, position? My position is that without God, you cannot know anything. Proverbs 1.7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. And Colossians 2.3 says I know. that Don't all of the treasures of... Well, I'm just for the, sake not, of other people who are, who, for the sake of other people who are watching... Just, Do you really yeah, think just, that anybody watching this video has not already heard this before? Most people that are watching this video are Christians, be. I assure you. No, no actually okay, I find that a lot of atheists actually do watch these videos as well. And so just uh, bear with me, all right? So Colossians 2.3 says, All the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hidden in Jesus Christ. All right, so my position is that without God, you can't know anything. I, I found that. Uh, those verses are literally true, that if you don't start with the fear of God, that you can't know anything. And you're saying that you know things, and I want to know, okay, beyond knowing that you exist, what else do you actually know? What's one other thing that you know for certain? Uh, where, do you, where do you go from there in terms of building a house of epistemology where you can have you know, beliefs that are coherent um, beyond just um, knowing that you exist or that blue is blue or, you know, basic things like that. Uh, I can only, you know, like I've already, I've already been honest enough to state that I can only make inferences about when we're talking about the, there being an in itself external from my first person experiences. Um, you know, I've already clearly stated that there's, I have, I don't know, I cannot tell you that I have access to those. And I would challenge you to show that God has, can have access to those. And asserting that, well, he's God doesn't answer the question. And it doesn't show that he does. It's not an argument. It's just, well, he's God. It's, it's, it's begging the question. So that's, that's what I would say. I would say that um, logic. If, is if there was a point. more powerful God than God, you know, then, then God would not be God. I mean, the, the, it doesn't make sense to argue that God is not all powerful because that's not God. You're you're using a right, straw. Right, you're man. not saying that before. It's not it's not good to well, use straw. Let me clarify that you're not saying that God can do what's logically impossible, right? Like God can't make a rock so big that's too heavy for him to move. God can't make square circles. God can't make married bachelors, right? Yeah, that, but that's not a power that that. You know, those would be weaknesses to be able to do the illogical. Um, that's got nothing to do with God. Okay, so God, God doesn't have a weakness to be able to do the illogical, correct? Yeah, God cannot do what okay, illogical. Okay, so then how does God know that any minds exist outside of himself? Because in order to know that, he's going to have to see <laughs> another mind, which violates the law of identity, which therefore he would be having a weakness by your definition of weakness. And so you believe in absolute rules of logic? 
I don't I don't want to use that term mean, absolute because I'm not exactly yeah, I'm not sure okay. what you mean by that. What I would say is that logic is a consequence. There's something called prescriptive logic and descriptive logic. Okay, prescriptive logic is the symbols that we use to refer to a reality of logic, which is the thing the appearances around us. For example, I was just talking about, you know, I would say that descriptive logic is a is something that was discovered and is a consequence of relational properties. So remember I was talking about things with borders and boundaries, things that exist that stand out. You can't have logic unless you have a universe in which things stand out or an illusion in which things stand out, whatever way you want to call it. So unless you have relational properties, Can I define this logic? Having identity, this or that having a specific identity, a, a standing out, right, a shape, hmm. you cannot have logic because there is nothing to refer to. There would be no thing to, to refer to. Do, do you see right. what I'm saying? So yeah, that's I what I'm so saying is like I think that I think that logic is quite possibly a consequence of minds, not a consequence of um, okay. not necessarily uh, something in itself. So, so, so before for all minds you know, this, can I ask you sorry, a question? Yeah. Yeah, before minds existed, would it have been possible for the universe to have existed and not existed at the same time and in the same way? Um, I think that uh, we have to define what you mean by exist. <laughs> I think you know what exist means. Well, that's... You know that's that's not answering my question because there are many there are many definitions of. Well, see, the problem is you're, you're saying that the laws of of logic are just contingent on human right, minds, right? I'm saying that it's quite possible that descriptive logic, which is something that we use to refer to things, right? This chair is itself and not not itself, right? And the reason why we know this chair is because there's something that's not it that we can relate it to. If there was only this chair, we'd have no relational properties and thus no identity. So but you don't even know that the is chair that what is. You mean by, is that really what you mean by existence? I'm, well, really, I'm trying to define it. So I, <laughs> okay, all right. So I'm trying to define it for you since you're having trouble so that you can say yeah, I agree or I disagree and then that way we're not arguing past each other and we're actually getting somewhere in this conversation. You see what I'm saying? I'm not trying to pull but, some trick on you. I'm just trying to understand what you mean by exist so I can properly answer your question. Existence. Exist. To, to be. I don't, I don't see what the problem is with that. I, th I think the question's quite clear. So... No, but there, are many emo there are many concepts of what being is. Like I've just given you the concept of being that isn't um, a thing in the sense that what you know the ancient Greeks would talk about appearances which is what they meant by things. You know we have we all we know right. is we have this phenomena right which is a word they use. All right well can I re I'll, I'll reword the question. So the law of non-contradiction states that things cannot be a and not A at the same time and in the same way. So if the laws of logic are merely descriptive and, and products of human minds, would it have would it be possible for violations of the law of non contradiction to exist before humans existed? So you're saying there would be a, a world independent of human minds that, and you're asking, could this hypothetical well, before, world... Before humans were created or before humans in, or any life um, in, in your thinking evolved, I don't believe in evolution, but... Um, of course you don't. You know, before life happened, yeah, would, the, would it have been possible for the universe to have existed and not existed at the same time and in the same way? If there is an external universe, and 
if what we mean by existence is relational properties? And I would say, no, of course not. Because relational properties are things which have identity. That is, they can be distinguished from what they are not. You can be distinguished by what you are not. You are not the space around you. Well, you are in an ultimate sense. But, wait, wait but, a minute, I'm, con I'm confused now because aren't you, aren't you contradicting yourself by what no, you said earlier that I'm you saying believe... I'm if in this hypothetical... Believe... Listen to what I'm saying. I'm saying if in this hypothetical world that you're positing in which there are relational properties, of course, then logic, then things which have specific shapes, borders and boundaries, mass, right? They would mm -hmm. have to... Um, be themselves and not not themselves. Why definition. would they have to? If if the laws of logic because that's are they, merely descriptions, you know, things that we've made up. Because with that's minds. I'm going to answer that real quick. Because that's what a relational property is by definition. So unless you want to change the definition of a relational property, then you know that's another story. But I thought we were in agreement that this hypothetical world would have relational properties. It would be an, in itself independent of human minds, right? It would have, there would be chairs there, there would be, you know, all these bushes and shapes and, and all these different things, things, things that stand out from space, mm -hmm. from from nothingness, from mm -hmm. non-differentiatedness, -differ um, then of course there must, then of course those things must be themselves and not, not themselves. But logic course, isn't a separate course, thing. Of course, according to what objective laws of, of logic, you, you just there is no. Um, listen, to what I'm saying here, there is. We're not. I'm not saying that there is some sort of law floating in the ethereal, some sort of Platonic law called the law of identity or the laws of logic, telling existence what to do. I'm saying that it is a consequence if this hypothetical existence, mind independent existence, exists then it is a consequence of that existence. You're, but you're, you're just assuming, though, you're out. assuming that the, the universe is uh, and always has operated in a logical fashion, but no, not. I don't see what basis you have for that. I, I'm not assuming that. I thought we agreed on this hypothetical world in which that was occurring. I didn't say that uh, that there was a world like this. This is a hypothetical, right? Well, let's let's posit it as a as a real possibility right now. How do you know that the universe right now is not existing and not existing, or well, weird things because, happening? I mean, some people believe in qu a quantum. Because li that it is listen happening to your question. Quantum. Listen to your question. I mean, your question is things that are existing and not existing. That's like saying married bachelors and and um, not married, you know, and and married bachelors. Uh, it, it it doesn't it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. It's going against the very definition of existence, which is relational property, which is. So why why shouldn't thing why why do things have to make sense? You see, you're borrowing in, from the biblical worldview in order to attack it. No, that's not why, because the biblical, biblical worldview cannot. The biblical worldview cannot account for these things either. No, the biblical worldview Not can. Even. I'll, I'll just, just let me uh, explain how. Is that uh, laws of logic are immaterial. Uh, they are not made of, made of matter. And laws of logic are universal. And they do not change. And God is universal. He does not change. And he's not made of matter. He's immaterial. So laws of logic make sense in the biblical worldview. They are a reflection of how God thinks. God is a logical okay, God. Well, I can just, and so I can he has put assert. within every person that knowledge that uh, when there's contradictions and that, that thinks something's not right uh, because we all know that God exists and to, to deny it is to suppress, suppress the truth and unrighteousness, as it says in Romans 1. Um, everyone knows that God exists and in order to try and attack precept and say it's been refuted and that, uh, you have to use laws of logic to try and attack no you don't no you view. don't because you're positing you are positing and in itself you're calling god that is supposed to where all of this you know logic emanates from according to your worldview and so what i'm saying is that the materialist right in this hypothetical world in which there are things 
relational properties that are in themselves independent of human experience or human minds or consciousness. And what I'm saying is that could be the very framework of logic from which logic stems, and there's no need for a god. I could just assert that as a, as a in itself, just as you're asserting God is an in itself. So there's no. Uh, you've got there's no, you've got no basis for knowing that. You're saying could be. You there's no basis for knowing that up. either. You have no basis for knowing that either. How does God know anything for certain? How does He know that other minds exist? You failed to answer <laughs> these questions, and thus you have failed. Thus, your very your very presupposition is circular, because you cannot. What's tell wrong with circular reasoning in your worldview? That, that you have not provided a basis for absolute laws of logic by sure. which to say if that circular reasoning have, is wrong. And I'm not sure, arguing if, in a viciously circular way. But but okay. I want to ask. So you guys, if 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 you want, I'm going to tell you. I'm going to answer your question. If you want to have a rational conversation which coheres to these rules we call oh, logic. Hang on. Who says that we have then to have a rational conversation? No, I didn't say we have to. I said if you want to, then in order to accomplish that goal, then we must remain logical. But that might not be the right goal. The right goal. According to whom? Well, that's the problem that, you, that, that, that you've got. But um, the, all of this time you're making all of these knowledge claims, and what I wonder is how do you account for the reliability of human reasoning? You've stated that you could be a brain in the vat, you know, or, uh, you know, in some other sort of weird well, reality. No, I, I'm saying that there so could be... How do you know that your reasoning is valid? Um, how do I know that my reasoning is valid? Because it's valid by definition. If my reasoning is that A equals A, then it must be um, valid by definition of what valid means. Um, so I, I'm not sure what other uh, definition of valid you're working under, but well, my, when when uh, when, when you give a reason for your reasoning, are you using your reasoning? See, this is where uh, where you're using size nonsense. Um, and again, any nonsense, world nonsense, nonsense, nonsense according to what objective uh, standard of reality or truth? According to according to uh, the rules of logic, according to my definition and uh, most people's definitions, if you were to talk to them, of what it means to have a valid, coherent argument. Um, it's like saying, it's like asking how do, me, how do you know that you have a valid, blue, coherent argument? Why is why is blue blue? Well, I don't know. It just is blue. There are certain things, as I've said with any worldview, that you're just going to have to come down to and say, it just is the way it is. And just like I asked you with God, how does God know anything to be certain? Why is God's will effectual rather than non-effectual? Why is God logical rather than not logical? You couldn't answer any of these questions. You couldn't even make sense of your questions without God. And you haven't been able to. You're, you're still so asserting you're that, your, but you haven't... Your, yeah, you, well, in my world, it's not just an assertion. The things that I am saying are not based on my own authority. They're based on the authority of the Word of God. There's uh, no such thing as authority. Pour me five ounces of authority. Well, just just <laughs> let me let me finish um, what I'm trying to say. And so, in the biblical worldview, we we know that we are made in the image of God, and so we have a basis for to base. No, you assume that. Let, let me finish, please. Uh, the basic reliability of human reasoning. We have a basis for that in the biblical worldview. If God exists, God has made us in his image and given us the ability to reason um, properly and to know reality as it is. And so within the biblical worldview, if God exists, we can know things uh, and, and God uh, enables us to know things for certain, uh, such as that God exists uh, and that reality exists and things like that. Um, so within the biblical worldview, I would say that your God, premises. God, I would, I would say your conclusion doesn't follow from your premises. We've not established that if God well, exists, you, well, that you can minute, have any of these things. You haven't shown that you know that your reasoning is valid. Do you, Do you accept that some people have invalid reasoning and you know total? I know. Totally? Do I accept that it's the same same crap that Psy pulls? Um, 
do you, how do I how, do you, are there people that whose reasoning isn't valid? Well, yeah, if yeah someone reasons, not, yeah. I know that I know that in the sense of if someone reasons that there is a um, flying spaghetti monster um, standing in front of me, then I know that. You know that's 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 not true according to my phenomenal experience, right? So some so, some people, yep. So you accept just just yes or no? Do you accept that some people are so insane that they don't know that they're insane? You you mean like um, uh, we'll say uh, what's the word, what's the term I'm looking for here? Schizophrenia, for example, where yeah, people extreme hear cases voices like that aren't yeah. there. Yeah, well, they're still experiencing. They're still they're still hearing sounds that aren't there, right? They're hearing sounds that are there, but they're not external to them. There's nothing. It's their it's their mind. So I'll, I'll, um, I can take that as a yes, right? That there are some people in the world who are so insane that they don't know that they're insane. Uh, defend, depending on how we define insane, yeah, I would say so. I mean, and sure. I, I'll assume that you've seen the movie Shutter Island. Yeah. yeah, it's a movie. You do realize that, yeah. right? Yeah, I realize that. How do you know that you're not one of those people? How do I know that I'm not? Uh, what do you mean? How do I know that you're not insane? Refresh my memory. What is he? What is he doing that in that movie? I remember it's Leonardo DiCaprio. Oh, I don't want to give away the whole movie for <laughs> for anyone who. Uh, who wants to watch it, but it's to do with insanity and, and people well, that are so insane having, that they don't know that they're insane. Yeah, but he was having experiences of, he was having um, paranoid delusions. I'm not having any paranoid conspiracies. Um, how do you know that? On. I don't, how do you I know that? Because I'm me. Well, you said that you're your ultimate authority. So, yeah, I know foundationally, that your, your reasoning is based on assuming that your mind is working properly, right? And your your you reasoning is your based on, and your reasoning is based on that my God's mind is working properly, and that He can know anything in order to reveal it to you. Well, hang on. You you said before you don't like straw manning and that, but that, that's a are straw man not, right here. Okay, let me rephrase that. Are you not saying that God can reveal things to you such that you can know them for certain? Yeah, and, and to argue that God can't know things for certain is absurd. God is God. How is it? How is it? I just explained that according to the law of non-contradiction, God is himself and not not himself, and you've already admitted that he cannot do anything that is logically contradictory, therefore he must be himself and not not himself, and therefore he cannot get over the heart, the problem of other minds. He cannot get <laughs> into is, your God, mind. God is God, and he's able to... He's all powerful. He can he can reveal some things to us, such that we know them for certain, and, and we, we give us an innate knowledge. We've already yeah. established. We've already established that all powerful does not mean violating the laws of logic. Correct. Uh, God does not do things that are illogical. Right, because they are in His nature. It's not a, it's not a uh, external limitation. It's an internal limitation. Correct. Oh, I mean, I can't believe that. That's how Sai. That's what Sai told me. Sai told me that it's it's an internal limitation. It's just something he doesn't do because it's against his nature. Yeah, that's right. It's, yeah. it's kind of, right. Yeah, but I can't. And, and it's, I can't believe it's, that you you're trying to. Well, I can kind of because it's, that's what happens when people deny the God that they know exists. They end up having to. No, see, here, here's my other argument. Irrationally. You're, 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 you are asserting, your proposition is that an entity exists which you call God, who's all powerful, all knowing, and in reading still exists. So that's the first, um, that's the first premise, okay? The second premise is, I do not know. I know that I do not know that God exists. And so how do you know God that? You haven't shown that hold you, on. You don't know therefore, that you're not this proposed insane. entity, because how do I know? Because I'm me, and I'm a knower, and that's what knowers do. You, you can't separate the function from performer, right? N minds are knowing, 
That's what but they you don't, are. You, don't know, you haven't shown how you know even one thing according to your own worldview. You're, you're stealing yes, from I have. your biblical worldview. The view. same way. No, you've been stealing from my worldview. The <laughs> worldview in which things are themselves and not not themselves, they are just what they are, just like blue. Is stealing, stealing objectively blue, morally wrong? Purple is just purple. Huh? Is I stealing you, objectively morally I do wrong? Not have, that's, that's ethical, not, not epistemic. So I, that's a totally another thing that we've already touched on. I do not agree that there is such thing as epistemic morals. That would be moral realism. Yeah, but you're and talking. I, as I would say that that things having are an objective, objectively wrong, and you're living that, that too. No, no one can live truly um, as if there are no moral absolutes. Even if if a person argues against them, you still get upset when people do things that you don't like and that's because you know in your heart of hearts that God is real but no. you're suppressing they, the that's truth. a huge leap that's a huge leap just because minds have um, likes and dislikes does not mean that there's a God that they know exists that doesn't even follow from your premise that there are minds that have likes and dislikes I admit as a nihilist as a moral nihilist that there are likes and dislikes that's the one thing I do admit. What I do not admit, and what I reject because I see no evidence for, no logical, coherent argumentation for, is that these likes and dislikes are somehow objective. That is incoherent as square circles because there can be no such thing as an objective opinion. It's an oxymoron to say objective opinion or an objective like or dislikes. Yes, there are things that people like and dislike, um, okay, we can use that same argument to say, well, Hitler wanted to kill Jews because he knew there was a God that, you know, <laughs> that, uh, that, that exists, right? It, it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't follow from, from, the, from the premise or from it, that conclusion doesn't follow from the premises. All right, well, show me how, uh, I think, I show think me we'll, how you can get okay. a, a, show me how it is true that equality ought to be the case. Show me how that's true. Because God pour exists me, and we're, we're all made in His image. Of equality, huh? Well, you see, the thing is, in my worldview, I can account for abstract concepts, but you can't in your okay. material worldview. I'm not a materialist. Who says well, I'm a materialist? How, <laughs> I have, I have so order, many videos to, on my channel critiquing in order to, materialism. Look up, look up the impossible problem of consciousness. My lecture on that. Um, look up my lecture on double aspect theory. Look up my lecture on yeah. Nietzsche's willingness right, to right, right. wherever okay. I can okay. okay. But, but the thing is that abstract concepts make sense in the biblical worldview because we have they a worldview where... They make sense in an idealist worldview. They make sense in an idealist you, worldview. Can you not a process interrupt, philosophy? Please, please just let me finish. Okay. All right. So abstract concepts make sense in a worldview where we have an immaterial God who lays a foundation for uh, immaterial, you know, in the, the spiritual world and, and things like that, that um, we are not just a physical bodies. And I, I don't accept you saying you're not a materialist, but the thing is that uh, without God, there is no basis for these immaterial concepts. There's no way of reconciling the material and the immaterial. Um, so that's that's the, the, the there's no there's no reconciling. Got. Show me how God solves the hard problem of consciousness. Show me how God solves the problem of other. God minds. has given us consciousness. Okay, and what is that exactly? How does that how does that how does consciousness correlate to um, material things, which is completely opposite? epistemically. Well, we're not just bodies. So there is clearly an epistemic. We, we are bodies that have spirits and souls. And that's who says that bodies, who says that bodies, first off, who says that bodies are the in, the, the in itself? How do you know that bodies aren't a representation of force or primal will or consciousness? How do you know that Schopenhauer... Well, that's the problem that you've got. Or uh, how do you know that, how do you know that um, process philosophy like that of um, you know, Alan North Whitehead isn't true, or that of Henri Bergson. Um, how do you know that their um, potential, their drops of um, experience, aren't the irreducible 
in itself. Like for instance, so so in process philosophy, in Whitehead's process philosophy, he has something called a part to whole relation in which you can know the in itself, that is things external to you partially, right? But there are some things that are just represented. So um, the, the in itself would be uh, drops of experience, these uh, um, consciousness, if you want to call it that, right? Just to make things simple. Could you be so wrong these, about that? These experiences, huh? Could you be wrong about that? Well, I had would argue that no, because he has a part to whole relation in which it is all one process, right? And I don't want to get into Whitehead too much because, but I'm just showing you that there are different uh, philosophies in which um, having a consciousness. You're showing me problem. inside the matrix. Well, you're, or well, outside you're, of the matrix. Your your critique only works on materialism. It doesn't work on uh, idealism or process philosophies. Because well, that's your, they that's don't your even, assertion, but but are, are you asserting these things inside the matrix or outside of the matrix? You there? Representation. It is the in itself, right? The way things really are. How do you know that an octopus is representation of the world or model of the world isn't really the in itself? Why do you presuppose that humans' representation or model of the world is the in itself? Well, I think I've already answered that, that question, and I'd, I'd, I'd like to move on to um, the topic of evolution, if that's okay with you, just for uh, a quarter of an hour or so. <laughs> All right, so, so uh, how long have we been doing this already? Uh, about an hour and a half or something, I think. I, I can't see the timer. Um, I forget exactly what time we started. Okay. We can um, stop now if you want to. If you want to stop there, uh, I think we've both said you know, a fair fair amount of what we want to say. Yeah. Another hour and a half or so. Um, Sorry, I didn't quite catch that. Can you say that again, please? You're, you're, gonna, you're cut out. If we get into evolution. It's going to be a whole other hour and a half or so because then you're going to be throwing out things that are like most creationists do that are oversimplification of the problems um, or the things that evolution is actually saying. And uh, I'd really like to avoid that because I'm not a scientist for one. I just accept the facts that I understand. I don't accept anything on faith. If someone, if a scientist puts an argument out that I can understand and that makes sense to me and that seems to correlate to my experience, then I'll say that may be true. But I don't just say, oh well, professor so and so says this, and so I accept it. Right? That's not mm -hmm. the way it works for me. Um, and unfortunately, that is the way it works for um, some atheists out there who just accept mm -hmm. things because a quantum physicist said it or a, uh, you know somebody else said it, right, who has some sort of authority, which again is a myth, um, they have a piece of paper that gives them a special title, um, and they think, well, because they have this special title, then that, you know, uh, gives them some sort of uh, gateway to truth that everyone else doesn't have, right? Um, I'm just, what I'm wondering so that's, is that's how, how I much... handle how much um, sort of study you've done on the on the topic? Because I, from from one of the other videos that I saw with you and James White, um, I just yeah, I was just wondering because um, it seemed to be you know something that uh, was was part of your reasoning for becoming an atheist. Oh well, I think it was part of it, right? But um, due to the Fossilized evidence that we have, right, of uh, okay. transition. I just, I, just want, I just want to know, like, like what sort of research you, you did. Um, you know, how thoroughly you you looked into. Oh, I've the, read I've read various articles on the subject. Um, you know, purely. Have you, have you read any creationist articles. books about this topic? Yeah, of course. I was a creationist. Of course, I have. But oh, but the thing okay. I've, I've read what, what all of that you, you all read? of Ray Comfort's books. Right? Oh, I've yeah. read, I wouldn't. Um, I wouldn't. Wouldn't uh, put them forward as 
being the, the best ones to read in, like, um, he's in terms a Christian, of right? well, yeah, but, I, but 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 um, I've read he's not a, he's not a scientist. Um, not that the issue is totally scientific, you know. That, that there's more there's a lot of philosophy tied up with it um, and biblical presuppositions. But yeah, I just uh, wonder if you've read, say, for example, the Answers book by Ken Ham, uh, and, and there's sci scientists that contributed to that book. Are Are you serious right now? No, I haven't read any Kent Ham, and even when I was a creationist, I didn't take Kent Ham any seriously. I Ken, was more Ken uh, Ham, not Calvinist. Ken Ham. I think you're getting confused with Kent Hoven. Uh, yeah, Ken no, Ham. Uh, Ken Ham, yeah, you're right. Ken Ham, I don't take, I've never taken Ken Ham seriously, nor did uh, Reformed Evangelist, who um, I preached with a lot, and we didn't take okay. uh, How about uh, Jonathan Sarfati? Have you read any of uh, his books? Like, he he wrote the most um, uh, popular creation book ever, um, refuting evolution. Have you read that one? No, um, I've read some so stuff he, by. I, uh, I encourage you to read that one because, I mean, that's um, kind of this is the concern that I've got is that um, you haven't really looked into things properly, um, and uh, yeah, you know, like. Just some of the key books that I would say are really good ones to read. Uh, one of them would be um, uh, Ken Ham's book, uh, The Answers Book. Um, and yeah, he was Ken editor Ham for that. A, Ken Ham is a scientist. Yeah, he is a scientist. Uh, and he, he was, no, he's not. Uh, he, no, he's he, not. He, he was a science teacher, uh, so he has studied science. That's not, uh, that's not a scientist. He's just, he, he, he has a degree in science. science. So. Um, but then that, in that book, that there matter. were what, other scientists that, that again, also just... That can, I, can I finish what I'm saying, please? That, that doesn't matter. Does he work in the field of science? What what peer-reviewed studies have he has he published? Um, yeah, what he was just the editor. To... He was just the editor for that book, and they did have other scientists that contributed to that book. But one of the other books... Um, I mean, the, the, the other one that I just mentioned before by Jonathan Safati, Refuting Evolution, uh, he is a scientist, a PhD scientist, and um, he uh, works like you know he he's worked in the field of science. Uh, and there are other PhD scientists. There was a, a, a book that was recently published that's one of the best ones I've ever read um, is Evolution's Achilles Heel, and they that was written by nine PhD scientists um, and uh, all. You know, arguing in their field of okay. expertise and, what, and showing what positive, why evolution studies, what, what positive peer-reviewed studies have they put forth in proof of creationism? Because all I ever see creationists do is put forth, oh, we we don't uh, this this over here seems to be a mistake, and that seems to be a mistake. They don't ever uh, put forth any positive studies, um, any kind of hypothesis. Um, or anything testable for creationism. Well, how, how would you know that when you haven't even read the basic book? I said everyone that I've read. Have you yeah, read... Well, um, you, you haven't read enough of the subjects. You haven't read enough of the other subjects. Just because I haven't read, read the ones that you've read doesn't mean that I haven't read up on the subject. But I mean, you haven't even read the basic have books, you, though. Have you, have well, the you introductory read, kind of ones. No, those may be un introductory where you're from, but they're not where I come from. Okay, those weren't the texts that we looked at. But here's what I'm saying: Have you have you looked at, um, for instance, have you read a basic uh, thing that they read in? It's like the textbook, um, a basic introductory. Have you read Dawkins' Greatest Show on Earth? Yeah, I read that, and I also read the refutation of it uh, by Jonathan Sarfati called The Greatest Hoax on Earth, and he goes through chapter by chapter refuting all of the nonsense. Um, have, you the, the have you read The Selfish Gene? Have you read The Selfish Gene? I have. I haven't uh, read all of it. I read about a quarter of it, and I, I just decided it was it was nonsense. Um, that had already been refuted by the stuff that Jonathan Sarfati has said in, in, in his books. Um, and also I read Origin of the Species, um, and I've read Jerry Coyne's book, Why Evolution is True. And the problems that I had with Why Evolution is True and, and um, the, the Greatest Show on Earth is that they kept on using equivocation where they would confuse speciation 
and call that evolution. They would just they'd give all of these things and say, you know, but they they were totally begging the question as to why they are assuming that their evolutionary view is correct when the creationist model fits the evidence just as Wait, well. Wait, say that again. They were better. what? They were what? Speciation. Equi using equivocation, community? where they would say this is evidence for evolution, when really it was just speciation. So dogs changing into other dogs, and there's like 300 or so different breeds of dogs today. They would use that kind of thing as an argument for evolution, when actually it's an argument for speciation, which is what we expect under the creationist model, where you have speciation up to limits, but not changing into whole new um, right. so you, creatures. So, so you, you, you say that there is, uh, that there is um, what you call um, microevolution, correct? No, I don't um, agree with the term microevolution, because microevolution assumes that there are small changes taking place, and the problem with that is we say, well, given enough time, then those small changes can become big changes. No, I don't even accept that. that. I don't accept the term microevolution. I use the term off, speciation. It doesn't assume. It doesn't. I don't accept the term microevolution either, right? Because I, I think that then you're putting this arbitrary line, right? Because that's one thing that evolution is stating that these things are evolving into uh, different branches of um, of the the gene pool. You know, out of all organisms on the on the planet, right? And we have um, fossils of you know transitional fossils, lots of them um, well, on we display don't, we don't have showing many. showing. Hold on, hold on, showing um, many different transitional or transitions occurring in the fossil record, and not only that, but DNA evidence. Um, and then also, do you do you uh, do you do you Get involved in? Uh, do you partake of any kind? Do you go to the doctor? Do you take any medicine? Do you take? Yeah. Uh, do Do you take? Um, uh, you know, vaccinations or uh, antibiotics yeah, I'm very or pro vaccines actually. You take what? I'm very pro vaccination, and, and it's sad that um, many people. Are, uh, let's not get into that topic because that's a whole another thing. Um. <laughs> that is a whole other thing, but I think that's but, just. I think that, you know, you, I think you that say that there's, with... there's transitional fossils, but we, all we have is a handful of supposed transitional fossils. And when you actually look at them, like Tiktaalik and these supposed, you know, things that are that are transitional creatures, you find that uh, they, the evidence sort of falls flat. You know, like these partial fossils, not even whole fossils, and uh, they're either some extinct creature, or um, you know, the, the, like in the case of monkey to man evolution or ape to man, uh, you know, there are all of the fossils can be better interpreted as either fully man or fully ape. Um, and so, well, yeah, all, off, all in, we have is a in an evolution, of there's supposed in evolution, transitional there's, fossils. In evolution, there's no absolute distinction between. Fully man and fully ape. Evolution is a continuum, a seamless continuum. Let me give an example. So, like for for example, when did you be, become you? Uh, if we look at your field conception. progression, if we look at your field progression, when did you become you? At conception. At conception. Now that's an arbitrary thing that you chose, right? You can you can go back farther than that, or you can. You can go up further than that, right? You can say no, it was at three months, or it was at four months, or whatever. People pick all kinds of places, right? It's like asking, when does a pile become a pile? And I can just put one grain on top of another one, uh, you know, another grain, and I can ask you, is it a pile now? And I could just keep asking you, when does it become a pile? And no matter which time you pick of how many grains, it's still going to be well. That's just how I define a pile, right? It's a concept. So. Existence as we perceive it doesn't work like these abrupt stops where you have this and then this. It's all part of the same genetic tree, ultimately. That's what we found in genetics. I mean, well, genetics is the other reason why I've had a DNA test. Huh? 
Genetics is the other reason why evolution can't be true. If evolution were true, there should be um, uh, an increase in genetic information that is able to be seen. And that has never been shown, and the closest that they've got is... Uh, That's not true. If what, you, what if you, it, if um, you type that, that in YouTube... That, if there you was the bacteria that, YouTube, that have changed, but they haven't really changed at all, and that's been refuted. Lenski's bacteria has it's been refuted on creation. No, if you if you type that in YouTube, to show that you're going to find. Just let me finish. Just let me finish. That the um, there was no new genetic information that was added with that bacterium. Uh, it, it was just uh, a switch being turned off, and that happened to be beneficial, but there was no new switch that was added. Uh, and, and so that is the supposed best example of an increase in genetic information. Um, but there should be millions of examples easily observable of an increase in genetic information. But we don't find that when we look at real science. That's not true. We, we find that all the time. Add a decrease in genetic information for, and, and uh, changes within kinds, but... Uh, speciation, not changing it into whole new creatures, as I said before. Are you still there now? I think I can yeah, see yeah, you yeah. in there. Okay, so you caught out there for a, for a minute. Um, we do find these. We find from from random mutations from when a... Uh, oh, hang on, hang on, hang on. Mutations are not new genetic information. No, hold on. Hold on. Well, let me explain. So when we find these miscopied Right, miscopied things. That's when new information takes place, and that happens all the time. Look, watch if you, if you Roth, something, Roth, you don't Roth have anything has dealt with this. Dunner has dealt with this. Uh, many of these, many of these materialist atheists have refuted this very claim that you're making. Many times, I mean, just type in some keywords, and you'll find many, many videos dealing with your assertion. I already have watched many videos, and the thing is that. The conclusions that people come to. Have you watched Aaron depend, Ross' videos on this subject? Yes, I have. Uh, or not all of his videos. I've seen some of his videos. I mean, he said there is no absolute truth, which is absurd. Um, I'm not talking it, about his. He's he's a bad philosopher. I'm talking about. I've heard his him actual... arguing and saying, and then a few moments later, or in another video, he says it's absolutely true that Noah's flood didn't happen. You know, and, and we know that for certain. When, when in another video he said we can't know anything for certain. You know, he refutes himself all the time. Um, yeah, I agree. The he's, thing is he's, that he's he's not too good at epistemology, and, and and I agree with that. But what I'm saying is is that he's good at yelling. I'm not I'm, I'm not talking about um, about that. I'm talking about his refutations of evolution. His entire series on this. I watched. I think I, 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 other... I watched about half of it, and it was. I didn't agree with it, and and. Um, I mean, the thing is that it depends on what your presuppositions are, and, and that's one of the reasons why See, that's, I can't That's what you're going to go down to every time. That's what you guys do. When you find something that, that isn't you know, fitting your presupposition, you just go, oh, well, it just depends on presupposition. No. Well, that's what you on, do. It, that's what everyone no, it's does. it's not. It's not. Like, I look at the evidence. I look at the, no, all evidence, I look at the evidence on their presuppositions. I look at the evidence... Right on the basis of appearances, and I put them all together, and I say, "Hmm, this could be true. It makes sense." I don't say it is absolutely true or, or any of that. I say this this might be the case. This is the so best. You have faith. This is you have faith no. I say, what the scientists say. That's said. not faith. That's not faith. I say that this is that is that is a um, faith is it depends on how you define faith. But faith is, you know, believing in something without evidence. Or without that's not my evidence. definition of faith. And I would say that my 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 standard of evidence is much higher than um, a lot of other people's evidence, right? I'm not just saying, oh, well, this you know this doesn't uh, go with my worldview, so I'm just going to reject this. I look at it and I say, does this explain um, does this explain cogently uh, the existence that I am experiencing, right? Mm. Yes, but the, okay. thing, the no. thing is that at I a subconscious level, people do. People do without even realizing it. They evaluate the evidence I, and not, things that don't fit in with their worldview I'm without not, even realizing they're doing it. I'm not. I'm time. not disagreeing with you that people do that. There, most people do do that, 
And, and, and you haven't even looked at all of the evidence, or, or a, a properly you, looked. You at haven't looked at all the evidence. You haven't looked at all the evidence. Well, we can't look at all of the evidence. I, I, I can look. That. At, but I, man, taking a good, honest I'll tell you look what, at I could both sides of the argument. Inbox. I could blow up your inbox all day with links to shit that you will never have time to read, even if you quit your job and just decided to read all of it. Okay? <laughs> I mean, nobody has seen all of the evidence. Let's let's be real here. I can only make decisions based off of the evidence that I have available to me and that I've seen. Now, I haven't seen anything. I personally haven't seen anything that convinces me that um, evolution is false. Now, but that that's a shame something that like that comes along. Something could, that evolution know, is false. Let's say that that comes along that evolution is false because this. I mean, whether evolution is true is really irrelevant to. Um, you know my my atheism, my lack of belief in God. It, it's 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 more of a conglomeration of many things, and we've discussed some of those things tonight. But evolution, if that's false, that doesn't make your presupposition true. Okay, that could that could lead to any number of uh, other deities proposed, and and even it doesn't even have to um, be associated with any kind of religion or. Um, proposed deity or god, right? So, right. so can all I, that can all I, that does is is something for you to point out and go see. Well, you know, this kind of coheres with my with my religion. Well, you know, it, it coheres with with a lot of other religions. So, um, you know, that's really a side issue. But yeah. I mean, I, I agree with you that that there are no brute facts. Um, in a sense, okay. I, I agree with that. I know Botson used to say that a lot, and I agree with Is that, that a fact? to some extent. Huh? <laughs> yeah, I know what you're saying. <laughs> there are no brute. Yeah, we I, did, I didn't hear what you said. So. Oh, I was saying, is that a fact? Um, <laughs> I, well, I, I know when I mean, say though. something, when I know I what you mean. We evaluate the facts based upon our worldview, and that's the thing. And so. Before I discovered presuppositional apologetics, I used to think, oh, well, you know, the atheists have got their worldview and the Christians have got their worldview, and we can never really decide which worldview is correct. Uh, we can have a strong, you know, and from my point of view, it was really strong in favor of uh, creation and, and Christianity um, because of my personal experience with the power of God uh, and because of what I'd read and and. Uh, and, and my right. own, uh, you, witness of the Holy Spirit, but you, what you I just start with, with you start with God, therefore logic, right? So well, that's you, what you I used. With, I used to be like that, but the the thing is, though, that when I discovered presuppositional apologetics, I realized that we can objectively settle the debate, and that presuppositional apologetics is irrefutable because if you reject it, you cannot know anything to be true. You can't get truth without yeah. God, and, and I think people yeah, we, listening to this, um, you know, that's what we're, this whole discussion has been over the last. Sure, hour I mean, or two. if somebody we've watching this, these things. if somebody watching this is a Christian or has a Christian bias, of course they're going to be convinced by your arguments. And if they if they watch this video and are not convinced or not have a Christian bias, they might be more, you know, um, open to what I've said in this discussion. So, really, that's you know, that's kind so of. So how can we settle? How can we settle the debate? You know, it, I used to think it was just you know the Christians are in their castle well, that's, and the that's atheists the thing, are in their castle. We're looking and at, we can never settle the debate. But the, what I've found is we're looking at we can views, settle the when, debate. When people are looking at world views, what they're asking themselves is how does this you know I think what if they you know I think that this is what I look at. Okay, maybe I'm not going to try and infer this on other people, but I look at how does this account for the experience that I'm experiencing, right? How does this account for it? And every worldview is going to have these just things that just are, as we've already discussed, things that just are brute. You know, they just are what they are, and there's no further explanation that can be given. Okay, so um, if you peel away enough layers, I mean, I, I, that's kind of the one thing I really want people to bring home from this is that if you peel enough layers from any any system of thought. You're going to find those things that just are what they are, and that that just beg questions and don't answer really anything. Well, God just is the way He is, or well, the universe just functions the way it does, 
or mine just functions the way it does, or blue is just blue. You're going to come down to these basic irreducibles that you just have to accept. Because yeah, without them, I agree, nothing I agree makes with sense. I agree right? with that. So, but oh. uh, the thing is that in, when you peel away all the layers and you compare the two worldviews, when you peel away the layers from atheism, you end up in absurdity and you end up reasoning that your reasoning is valid and not, not being able to know whether or not you're insane or whether you're a brain in a vat and not being have any basis for knowing anything really with any certainty. But when you peel away the layers from the Christian worldview, you get down to a logical and coherent worldview that makes sense of all other, um, of, of everything. Um, and do you see what you just did there? You, when it came to describing my worldview, you uh, biasly described it in a certain way. And when it came to your worldview, you neglected to mention the fact that God has no basis for knowledge and cannot account for why he knows anything. And when I well, even asked you that question, before, when I even asked you that question on Facebook, you were like, what? What? You didn't even answer my well, question. Yeah, because I, and so because if you're going to be honest, if you're going to be honest, you'll say, yeah, there are these basic assumptions in my worldview that, that yeah, there's, no, there's no arguing for them. They just are the way they are, and there's no accounting for them. I can't account for why God, well, in my worldview, why God has a nature the way he does. You I know, don't I have can't, I can't. assumptions at the, at the very core. I have God as the necessary presupposition for knowledge. It's not an oh, assumption. Well, That's I have my I mind. Know. I have knowing as the necess necessary precondition for knowing. So, so that's really that's no less circular than that's no less circular for for yours for for what you're saying. God, God just is the way He is. So, therefore, He just knows everything. Well, I just know some things for certain because, well, that's the nature of mind to know some things for certain. If things didn't stand out, there wouldn't be nothing for mind to know, right? So that's what I'm saying. If there wasn't phenomena, there couldn't be knowing because there would be nothing to know. And so there are just these certain things that you, that you have to accept. Now, if you're going to be honest, you'll admit that. You'll say, look, hey, you know, I said if you're going to be honest. I'm not saying you ought to be. But if you're going to be honest, then, then I think you have to kind of say, look, I have to presuppose that, that this God just is the way he is. And I can't account for that. And um, I don't think I need to account for that, and that's fine. But see, I can well, do the same I, thing. I, I can account for it, and I think I have. But one other question: You can account I, for why I God is logical you. rather than not logical. Yeah, I thought I already had. But um, one no, other question: you I wanna... Why don't you do that right now? Why don't you explain to me why God is logical rather than not logical? Well, we can we can come back to that if if you want. But I I want to ask you um, another question. Just just um, you know, we're going to have to close it soon. Well, see, because um, now look, yeah. if you if you like, no, if if you say if I ask you why is God logical rather than not logical, you're gonna have to say because it's his nature. It's his nature. Yeah, I agree. To do I agree so. with that. And if I ask you why is it his nature to do so, you're gonna have to say it just is. There's no other. What other thing are you going to be able to say after that? There are just these basic things that you have to just presuppose in order to make sense of your experience. Why is blue blue? Because it just is. That's the nature of blue, to be blue, right? Why? Well, it just, it's the same question with God. Why is God what he is? Well, he, he just is the way he is. And that's what I'm saying is if you're honest, you won't describe my worldview as the way you have. Instead, you'll describe it as, as, as that. But you don't want to do that because you don't want to put it on an equal footing. You want to pretend that you have some sort of worldview superiority, just like the atheists, don't want to admit that they don't have any grounding for morality, and they want to say, "Oh no, no, my 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 morality is is somehow superior to the Christian or the caveman morality." They talk about morality as something that has progressed, right? So they're assuming the very thing they're trying to prove, which is that morality can is is something that's progressive, is something that's true, right? And not just a subjective, "Well, I like this and you like that," right? So. In order to avoid the very same hypocrisy and underhandedness that a lot of atheists are doing, secular humanists and these atheism plusers, you're going to have to be consistent and say, look, 
to be honest here, I have certain things that are just irreducible in my worldview that cannot be reduced to any further and cannot be accounted for, right? Because you cannot account for why God's nature has is logical rather than not logical. You're going to have to say he just is. It just is. And okay. that's my... Okay. When you get down to the materialist worldview, they're going to have to say it just is material. It just is what it is, right? And even that can be yeah, refuted. Can, 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 yeah. You're kind of straw manning my, my argument because it's not my argument is not God is because God is. Uh, my argument is God is, and at a core level, God is the necessary presupposition for knowledge, and that's just the way it is. And if you reject it, you can't know anything. In the same way that if you deny logic, you need to use the laws of logic to argue against the laws of logic. But what I want to ask you, though, is um, to do with your spiritual experiences, because that's one of the right, and I'm part saying of, that, part of and I would testimony. disagree with. I would disagree with that with that argument. Yeah, I understand because, that. Well, we could go on all okay. day. I think we've already kind of covered that. Um, right. Okay. In the last few so, hours, so okay. So all right. So what were you going to ask me? Go ahead. Uh, all right. So I'd, I'd like to ask you what sort of whether you've really experienced God's power in your life, because that's something that. Um, you know, for me, it's part of my testimony is that I have experienced God's power, um, and so yeah, I understand intellectually that God is real, and presuppositional apologetics has helped me. Right, and if I ask uh, you, that area, if I ask you, how I've do also you know? Experience God's presence and and and, and God's power in, in a powerful way, and and um, yeah, it's it's one of the reasons why. I'm a Christian is because God isn't just an intellectual abstraction to me. I have experienced God's power, you know, one, uh, on many occasions. It's been so powerful. What do you powerful mean by power? I, what, what do you mean well, power? like at like at church or when I've been praying and I've I've felt the power of God come on me and it's felt like a tingling feeling, like electricity going through my body and and just um, not Mormons painful. Say the um, same thing. Mormons say they have a burning in their bosom. Yeah. Yeah, I understand that. I understand it's not and proof. I understand it's not proof of Christianity, but it, it's um, it's part of my testimony, and it's part of the reason why I'm a Christian is that I have experienced God in my life. You know, I understand. When I, when so you I have... felt, just can you can you let me finish, please? And yeah, go ahead. Okay. When, when I have had these experiences, many times it's been so powerful I haven't been able to stand up. You know, and I've been on the floor for like half an hour, not because someone's pushed me over. But because God's power came on me and I was unable to stand up, and and I, I've also had answers to prayer and you know things like that, and we we could talk for a long time about things like that. Where there's been things that have happened that uh, you might just say, oh well, that's just coincidence, but it was some pretty amazing coincidences. Um, and when you were a Christian, I had things like that. Did happen. you I had things have like that happen? Things like that happen. Sure, and I'll even tell you if one um, where when I was going to the Ambassadors Academy, which is uh, through Ray, Ray Comfort's uh, Living Waters thing. Well, he has this Ambassadors Academy where they teach at up near preach, and I got a scholarship to attend this because um, Paul Kaiser, who is Reformed Evangelist on YouTube, he teaches. Um, for Ray's Ambassadors Academy, and he's been, um, you know, been an open-air preacher for, for years. And I was going through, I was homeless at the time when I was doing all of these, uh, I was going on campuses like UC Davis, and uh, I went to James White White's debate and met him and, and uh, um, preached on the corner of Court Street and Liberty and stuff. Well, I was homeless while I was doing all this, and I was working two jobs, but I was paying something called child support, so I always had enough for child support, but I never had enough for rent. So I was working these two jobs while I was homeless. And yet I was putting all this time into evangelism. And so I was very sincere, um, regardless of what people might think about me now. I was very sincere, and I really believed that um, you know God was real and, and all of this stuff that you're saying. And I remember praying, you know, um, because... I really I didn't have enough food. I went to the Ambassadors Academy with basically no food money and uh, no way to um, 
you know, take care of myself while I was there. And sure enough, you know, Ray Comfort well, he's giving us a tour of the, the headquarters over there where they, they send out all the tracks and stuff that, you know, little gizmos that he sells. Um, he just drops a $100 bill on the ground. And he didn't know nothing of my situation, right? And so I attributed that to God. And there's been a bunch of, you know, scenarios like that that have happened to me. I mean, there's been people who are Mormons who prayed that, you know, God would start the car, and then the car started, right? And 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 that's the thing is, like, we can always, you know, appeal to these these emotions and stuff. And I know you're not trying to use this as an argument. You're just trying to show, hey, look, there's another side to this that that mm. another reason why I believe, which is not necessarily, you know, abstract and philosophical and rational. Mm. It's it's more of a, a personal thing. And and I get mm. that. And I and I have experienced that. I mean, whether anybody believes it or not, I've experienced something like that, even if you want to think it was an illusion, and you know, I was never a Christian because once saved, always saved, or, you know, I wasn't one of the elect if you're a Calvinist, whatever it might be. Um, so have you experienced... That's one thing we should have gotten into. Presence, you and, know, like, maybe, as a feeling, not just, like, an answer to prayer, that it could be coincidence. Sure, I mean, there and there were times when I had such feelings of, of gratitude for, you know, looking at the cross and, and what Jesus did for me. And I had a lot of, you know, inner um, qualitative states of, of, of the feeling of gratitude for that. And there was, there was a lot of, what I guess I'm really trying to drive home is there was a lot of sincerity. I mean, I really believe this stuff. And, and, I, and I think it was, it was kind of a crutch for me because I was homeless and um, it helped to believe that there was a God in the sky who, no matter, you know, I could get robbed, I could get, there's a lot of shit that could happen while I'm sleeping in a bush, right? And, and so it would really help to believe, kind of like a stoicism, if you will, that God has already ordained all things and, and you know, his will, uh, I just need to, you know, harmonize my will with his will and, and let, trust that he will take care of everything. And that was really comforting for me, right? Hmm. But, you know, so I, I can identify with that, and I have, you know, um, I, I often get angry at, at atheists for being really mean uh, mm. to theists. And, and sometimes I can be mean, but it's just because some theists can be really underhanded and, and uh, you know, really um, intellectually dishonest. And, and it ticks me off because I've spent a lot of videos pointing out, you know, their, uh, you know, atheist problems, right, in, in the atheist community. So it would seem to me that here you see this guy who's trying to be honest, he's trying to deal with both sides and not take sides and not be playing favorites, but, you know, critiquing them um, with equal fervency, right, and not saying, well, I'm going to look past that because I'm an atheist and that's something an atheist is doing, but saying, no, that's something they should be called on because that's, something that I see as an inconsistency in their part, and iron sharpens iron, I want to try to help them. And so I get flack from both sides, right? But every mm -hmm. once in a while, I get a Christian that comes along like Dustin Seegers, who, uh, who I really like. I like Dustin Seegers. He's a very sincere guy. We disagree in a lot, obviously. He's, he's like around in your position, and he's, you know, he's a presuppositionalist, and he's friends with Psy. But mm. there's something about him that, because he's such a sincere guy, and, and you can see that about him, and he's not in trying to win an argument. You know, he's, he's really concerned. You can see that he's really concerned about the, the person or the individual. That right there um, makes me want to try to understand him more. You see what I'm saying? Versus somebody who comes in and says, you know what? Uh, your worldview is inferior to mine, and here's why. He doesn't do it like that. He comes in, and he talks to you, and he's personable, and he has his way of letting you know that he cares about you as a person. And, and that's somehow, even though you may end up disagreeing with him at the end of the discussion, you still have this, this kind of unspoken respect for the man. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, and, and, I, and I, I hope that you... Um don't just feel that I'm just trying to win the argument here with you, that I do actually care about well, you and I care I about other people. Like, um, 
uh, you know, that the motivation why I do this, I believe, you know, my motivation is that uh, people would come to know Jesus and, and that people would be helped through um, the ministry that I that I have. Um, and so, you know, um, I hope that you feel that I, I at least care a little bit about you because uh, I do. Well, yeah, I, I'm not, yeah. Even though it's I mean, difficult to really, you know, care about someone just over from a short conversation like like this um, but sure. yeah I do I do try to be honest in my arguments and um, yeah try and understand where people are coming from um, we'll, we'll finish soon I think but I um, one of the other things I I have on my website um, so that my website's God or absurdity com and uh, on the right hand side um, one of the pages is on wisdom and uh, I hope you will check that out too, and and, and other people are listening. Um, it, it deals with some of more, more of the heart sort of issues, and also sure. relating to. And I'd like to like say even, that I read that. Even if I'd if, like to. Can I just finish what I'm saying? Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. So even if a person um, rejects Christianity, uh, if they follow biblical principles of wisdom, then they will be blessed. And if they ignore wisdom, they will suffer the consequences, whether a person is a Christian or not. And when, you know, I've studied the, the Bible for years and years and, and studied uh, to get more truth and wisdom, and there's been so many things that I've discovered from the Bible that uh, there's so much wisdom in them. And if we live by those things, uh, then we will be blessed, um, and so yeah. I mean, to to build, for example, self-esteem. You know, to build your self-esteem on the Word of God and on on your relationship with God, knowing that you're loved by God, is a solid foundation for having self-esteem. But if you reject that, people tend to build their self-esteem on their ministry or on their work or on their um, social life or whatever, and all of those things are not going to last, um, certainly not going to last one beat beyond their last heartbeat, uh, but they're not going to last in terms of this life. Uh, and so if, we've, if we forsake wisdom, tears are coming. Um, and uh, so yeah, I hope that you'll continue to search for truth and um, that you'll look into and think about the things that I've that I've shared. Right, and and I want to say that you know, uh, it's not that I think there's no objective reality or anything like that. Um, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to be you know really mm. honest about um, the limits of my epistemology, right? Mm. And and all of this is based on the plethora of books and stuff that I've read. Um, I don't comment generally unless I've really, really studied it. Like, you know, it took me years to really comment on Nietzsche and read mm. everything he's ever written. And maybe more than, certainly all of his books more than once before I could say I can comment on that, right? Mm. And and so that's all I do is is study and read and, and, and write, right? And debating yeah. is something that I do quite a bit. So... You know, I, but yeah, I, I see what you're saying, and, and there are. I'm not saying that there's no truth in in the Bible or anything like that. Um, mm. Certainly, there there are bits of truth. In fact, if you, I studied Stoicism for a while, and I went, you know, back to their original texts, uh, or not original texts, but the texts we have in Greek, like from that of Marcus Aurelius, right, or um, Epictetus, or whatever Epictetan texts. And mm. you know, I I I studied that and. There's a lot of similarities between Stoicism and Christianity. Things that the Stoics said first that the Paul picked up on later. Um, in fact, in Acts, uh, Paul mentions uh, one of the great Stoics, uh, his family member, I think it was his brother or something, mentions mm -hmm. his brother. Um, and I'm talking about Seneca, by the way. Seneca mm -hmm. lived around that time. But mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of similarities in a lot of these philosophies. You can You can tie them all together and see that Oh, this philosophy is basically saying the same thing as this one, and 
there are these truths in, in square quotes, uh, scare quotes. Uh, you know, there there are these truths that if you do this action, you are more likely to get that action, right? These kind of consequentialist things, like. If you are sincere with a person and you come across as personable and polite and you come across as though you're caring about the person and, and not just trying to, you know, win an argument, mm -hmm. then that person could be more receptive to what you have to say, right? Yeah. And they're not going to put up this wall right mm -hmm. at the get-go, right? Because they just think you're a jerk and they just want to refute you any, by any means necessary. Mm -hmm. and, and that's not what you want, right? Mm -hmm. You want a good... You want a good, profitable discussion in which every both parties feel like, you know, they're, uh, you know, it's not just about slinging arrows and you know bats and stuff at each other. It's it's kind of about coming to some cogent conclusions, right? Um, mm -hmm. And and even even disagreeing, you know, agreeing to disagree at some point. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, yeah. that's just the way it goes. But all right, it's been a great discussion, and um, we, you know mm. we should have something again. I, I've done a lot of yeah. studies on the New Testament, you know, the original language and things like that. And I did a whole series, uh, two series, on that on my YouTube channel because Dr. White was calling in to question my my knowledge of Greek, and so I went ahead and proved him wrong by doing a couple different series where I actually translate. Um, mm -hmm. large passages of the New Testament and break down each word and give you the history behind some of the words and even the you know the tenses and some of the grammatical science behind it so um, you know it's a it's a it's one thing that I like enjoy talking about is is uh, even though I'm an atheist I do I do enjoy talking about New Testament theology which you know a lot of my fellow non-believers find to be um, you know, maybe repulsive or, you know, mm. whatever. But I do find that interesting um, yeah. because there are so many different interpretations and I like to be able to go back and say, but, you know, that's not what this word here is saying or, or that's in the perfect tense or, you know, that's the present tense. You right. know, and... and um, we, we better stop um, soon because... Yeah, yeah. It's, it's um, already been quite a long discussion and, and um, yeah, we'll, that's, uh, we can do this again um, another time, and um, sure. I, I hope that you've found it helpful. And, and uh, obviously, we we're, we haven't settled the question. It's, well, it's I, 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 think, I think the question's settled, but uh, we'll, we'll have to do, agree to disagree uh, at this sure. point. You haven't and said, you hopefully haven't said there, anything. Hopefully, Sorry. there'll be quite a, quite a few views on this video because um, you know. Uh, I want to get the truth out there, and, and there's a lot of videos on YouTube that say precept refuted and all this, and I'm like, hang on, hang on, uh, you know, to to me, it's precept is irrefutable, and you know, one of the big things is that uh, there is no escape without God for reasoning that your reasoning is valid, and I know that you'll you'll disagree with that, and that's what we've trying to been been dis discussing over the last few hours. Um, so um, yeah, it's it's been good talking with you, though, James, and and I hope that uh, that um, obviously I hope that you'll come to come back to the faith, or uh, there'll be some online will argue, oh, you never were a Christian, but I'm not going to argue one way or the other on that. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I I hope that um, you feel that it's been worthwhile, and that other people can watch this and and find it worthwhile too. Sure, and there's always something else that I'm that I'm thinking. Oh, you know, I could mm -hmm. press him on that, or I could press him on that. But this would yeah. just go on yeah. forever. Uh, even what you just said there, you know, I was going to press you on selflessness. Uh, do you really do anything out of selflessness, and does that even exist? There, there. I mean, there are so many things that yeah. that we philosophers think about that you mm. know a lot of people don't even think about, but just these little yeah. things. But um, uh. Yeah, it's it's been a nice chat, and uh, we'll have to do it again sometime or something. Yeah, uh, and maybe, yeah, sorry, maybe sorry to hear too about some of the things that you've had happen, like being homeless. You know, that must have been really tough for you. Um, so yeah, sorry to hear about that. I hope that uh, things are going better for you now. Obviously, you've got internet connection. Well, yeah, things are things What's are going great right? now. You know, yeah, okay. exactly. Good. Good. And you know, things are fine now, but. Um,
it wasn't for for many years, and unfortunately, yeah. and, you know. Um, but but I hung in there, and I just kept plugging away, and yeah. you know, kept kept studying. You know, I didn't have money for college, so I just went out and I got the textbooks, and I got, you know, I made friends with professors, and I made friends with people that know what they're talking about, and I hmm. found out the books to read, and you know, where to get my knowledge from, and where to study. For example, Schopenhauer, Nietzsche, any of these things. And when I, you know, was stumped, uh, you know, I I had people to help me out. And that's the thing is, you mm. know, um, like Nietzsche will say something that people will perceive as self-refuting, but then if you go and look at the totality of his work, you'll see that it's actually not. If you're looking from an, his ontological perspective, you'll understand mm. his perspectivism and why it's not. But... Um, you know, when I originally saw some of these things, I thought, oh, that, that's self-refuting, right? Because I was coming from your your neck of the woods. Mm. And once I got to understand the philosophy, I began to realize that it wasn't, and, and it all came together. Um, so that's, that's I think that's important for us to really, uh, um, you know, really, even when we're critiquing another worldview, to make sure that we understand that worldview like right. they understand that worldview. You know what I'm saying? Like really yeah. immerse yourself in that worldview, right? And mm -hmm. that's what I've done. So, yeah. and, and I'll okay, continue we, we, to do that. We're, we're going we're gonna to stop it there because, yeah, it's, uh, it's already right. going to be quite a, quite a few hours long. I don't know how many. Uh, it might be two and a half or even <laughs> three hours. But anyway, we'll, we'll stop it there if that's okay with okay. you. All right. Yeah, so uh, see, All right. see you later, James. Bye, James. All right, bye. All right, bye-bye.